Institute of Statistical Mathematics. Um, and their, I have already put their access to their slides for today's um, talks, so you can download them. You can see, the, see it in the chat. And you can also uh, ask questions uh, writing in the chat during the talks and their, their speaker can see them later. Okay, so um, their first speaker on uh, today's seminar is Daisuke Murakami. Um, mm -hmm. The title is Compositionally Warped Additive Mixed Modeling Application to COVID-19 Data in Japan. So Murakami-san, could you prepare? Okay, okay. Sharing the slide. Okay. So can you see? Yes, please start. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Daisuke Murakami, and today I will talk about um, extension of uh, additive model for non-Gaussian data, and apply that method to uh, COVID data, uh, COVID analysis in Japan. So in this study, I first develop a computationally efficient additive model for non-Gaussian data. And uh, in this study, I focus on a uh, compositionally warped Gaussian process, uh, which I will call CWGP. Um, I focus this, this approach because <coughs> it flexibly model non-Gaussian data without any assumption about data distribution. And also, uh, this approach is uh, computationally really efficient. So I think this approach is very uh, practical. So I focus on this approach for non-Gaussian data modeling. And uh, in, this uh, in this study, I will combine this CWGP with uh, additive model, which is a popular regression approach. <laughs> and by doing so, I, I will uh, develop an approach to automatically estimate data distribution, just like CWGP. And uh, also, uh, the, mod the method I will develop will estimate a wide variety of effects from covariates, like uh, spatial effect or temporal effect. Uh, just like uh, additive model. And so I, I also try to uh, make the algorithm fast, fast, as fast as possible uh, because the final objective of my study is to uh, publish this approach on, in an R package. So I will, today I will develop a uh, combine uh, these two approach for flexible non-Gaussian data modeling. And on the second part, I will apply this method to a uh, spatial analysis of COVID in Japan. So, so let me introduce the uh, Gaussian process. Maybe all my all you might know, but uh, it is a stochastic process with uh, dependent on the mean and covariance. And so, so uh, if Y follows a Gaussian process, it will, it is uh, usually written like this: a mean and covariance. And basically, uh, this GP try to uh, estimate some smooth process like this uh, behind uh, observations shown by these dots. So uh, it is useful and uh, it's likelihood for any observations uh, is written like this. And basically the maximization of this likelihood try to minimize error variance while considering a uh, kind of uh, log determinant. So it is very simple. And the, the CWGP I focus is an extension of the warped Gaussian process. Oh, warped Gaussian process, uh, WGP. And uh, this one uh, assumes a Gaussian process for a transform explained variable, Y. So I mean, so this phi is a transformation function. And for example, if the phi represents a logarithmic transformation, then the WGP assumes a GP on the log transformed Y. So it is very simple approach. So I mean, this is Y is observation and it is log, log transformation. So, so in this example, so uh, if I apply a log transformed Y, then just uh, assume, assume, assume GP for the log transformed Y. And the likelihood function is like this. And it is basically identical to the uh, original GP, 
but the green part is the only difference with the original one. And this term is included to consider the complexity of the transformation, such as transform, a log transformation. But basically, this term is, uh, can be evaluated computationally efficiently. Uh, this uh, this uh, WGP is a kind of computationally efficient method. And the CWGP, which I will focus in this study, is also uh, very similar to the WGP. So the model structure is exactly identical to the Wapt Gaussian process. But uh, the only difference is the definition of this transformation function. And in this CWGP, this function is defined by concatenating the transformation functions, like uh, this one, uh, these functions. And I mean, uh, in this approach, the y is transformed by the first, first function and then transformed by the second function and third function and so on. Then basically this approach iterates the transformations to, uh, to transform non-Gaussian data to uh, Gaussian data, y tilde. So it is more flexible than WGP because it, it just iterates uh, the transformations like this. But the likelihood function is still very, close, very similar to the original Gaussian likelihood. And again, the only difference is this Jacobian term to capture the complexity of the transformation functions. But uh, based on their study, the transformation, uh, this Jacobian term can be uh, evaluated uh, computationally efficiently. So it is also a computationally efficient approach. And so I will then explain about how to specify the, the transformation functions. And in this original study of, uh, study of CWGP, they uh, propose a SAL transformation, a sin H, arc sin H and affine transformation, uh, which is, is defined <coughs> like this. And basically this transformation first transform the observation Y using an uh, arc sin H transformation. Then it is again transformed using a sin H transformation. So this is uh, this, uh, this called SAL SAL transformation. So they said if we iterate this transformation d times like this, the, a wide variety of uh, non-Gaussian data y can be uh, transformed to a uh, nearly Gaussian distribution. So, uh, so, uh, so, but uh, I'm not sure it, 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 uh, it's really true. So I tested the performance of this kind of iterative transformation using this SAL transformation. So, so I tested the performance of this transformation. So in this case, I tested three transformation, three cases. In the first, I assume a beta distribution, and the second is QT, and the third is Gaussian mixture distribution. And for each case, I applied this uh, SAL transformation D times. So D means the number of uh, transformations. So if I apply this SAL transformation, uh, for example, beta is uh, transformed to nearly Gaussian distribution. And QT and Gaussian mixture distributions are also uh, transformed nearly Gaussian distributions. So as far as checked this approach, uh, this uh, CWGP or the trans SAL transformation can uh, transform a wide variety of non-Gaussian distribution as shown here to uh, nearly Gaussian distribution like this. Uh, because of that, uh, I focus on this SAL transformation to model uh, non-Gaussian data. So again, so I assume that this kind of uh, iteration transformation functions to uh, transform this Y to a uh, nearly Gaussian distribution, then this is model. And, uh, and in this study, I try to combine this CWGP with an additive model. Uh, 
to model non Gaussian data without assuming any data distribution, just like CWGP, and also to consider a wide variety of effects like spatial or temporal effects like additive model. And, uh, and also, because I have developed a uh, fast algorithm for linear additive model, I have applied to that algorithm to, for fast computation of this uh, approach, CWGP plus additive model. Okay, so, so because I have explained CWGP, so I then explain this uh, additive model quickly. So it is a uh, linear additive model, which is popular regression approach. And uh, basically, it tries to uh, estimate a wide variety of effects uh, using a function, kind of smooth function, depending on uh, covariate z. So by specifying this term, we can consider a wide variety of effects uh, as shown here. So for example, uh, uh, in the later analysis, COVID analysis, I will use uh, kind of spatially varying regression questions, so questions varying over space. And also I will, in, later I will consider a kind of group effect or a random effect in the data analysis. So like this, we can consider a wide variety of effects in this regression uh, additive model. So, I, so because it is very practically useful, I will focus on this model. And uh, this, so this slide illustrates um, application of this uh, additive model to show the usefulness of this approach. And in this study, uh, they use a linear additive model to analyze uh, kind of uh, air pollution analysis and using a uh, black smoke particle data, which is a uh, spatial temporal data. And uh, so they use this kind of model to uh, identify spatial, spatial or temporal structure behind uh, air pollutant. And uh, as a result, they, they, get, uh, they mapped, they estimate some areas below the current health standard. So for example, in this study, uh, based on this their result, in 1963, the kind of uh, pollutant areas are widely spread, but in 1969, the polluted areas are very small. And now London is kind of a clean air area. So, so this is just an example, but uh, so using this, uh, by applying this uh, additive model, we can do this kind of uh, analysis, like environmental analysis or other analysis. So it is very useful in practice. Uh, but, but, uh, because many data are non-Gaussian, have non-Gaussian distribution. So I combine this CWGP and additive model uh, just by add adding this uh, transformation term like this. So it is still very simple extension. So just the data is transformed by the uh, concatenating the transformation function and the transformation fun transformed by is assumed to have a linear structure like this. And so I, I will skip the detail, but uh, basically the likelihood is also very simple and we can apply a very fast algorithm. And uh, so basically because this is a kind of Gaussian model, the likelihood function is very similar to the Gaussian likelihood but only the green parts are the only difference. And uh, because uh, the theta is a uh, parameters for the transformations. And because y is transformed by using the transformation function, and y is dependent on the parameter for the transformation. So it, it, this is one difference. And another is uh, just like a uh, warped Gaussian process, we have another term for evaluate, uh, evaluating the complexity of the transformation. Uh, so th th this is slightly different, but uh, still very close to, similar to the likelihood for additive, linear additive model. So because of that, uh, fast com computationally efficient uh, estimation algorithm is applicable to, to the likelihood maximization. Okay. Okay, so, bas so basically this is my proposed approach. So next I, so to test the performance of this uh, additive 
our model, I have uh, com compared uh, coefficient estimation accuracy to uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And here I assume a spatially varying coefficients for one smooth term. And its uh, estimation accuracy is evaluated in two cases. And here, for just, just for data generation, I used a uh, 2KG and H distribution, uh, which is a distribution that can consider uh, skewness and fatness of distribution. So the data is generated using this distribution, and this is one, just one case distribution with fat tail case. And I assume two cases, one is fat tail, the another one is fat plus uh, skewness data. And this time I compared our approach uh, with number of transformation one to four so here. And the accuracy is compared with this model with a linear regression and linear additive model. And this is one is comparison result of uh, spatially, uh, estimation accuracy of spatial varying questions. And the y-axis means uh, fatness of the distribution. And the fatness equal zero correspond to a Gaussian case. And in this case, the linear additive model uh, performs pretty well. And uh, the accuracy is very similar to our approach. But uh, if the fatness uh, increase, the accuracy of linear additive model uh, rapidly uh, go back, get bad. So, so linear model cannot be, of course, cannot be, uh, should not be used to this kind of fat, day, fat tail data. But uh, in, our, in our approach, uh, if the number of transformation is more than two, the RMC value is quite small relative to the linear model. So based on this result, our transformation works pretty well to reduce the question estimation error. And a similar result is uh, obtained also in case with uh, skewness. Again, the linear additive model have very low accuracy from that severe fatness and skewness. But our, appro my, our approach basically uh, estimate uh, question accurately even in an ex extreme case with uh, strong fat skewness and fatness. Yeah. So this slide shows a computational uh, no, estimation accuracy of our approach. And then uh, I evaluated computation time for the, our, our, pro, our approach. Uh, but sorry for that, but it's just a linear case, linear model, but uh, the order of computation, the com complexity is the same as the linear case. So I just show the linear case comparison result. <laughs> And here I have compared our algorithm with uh, another popular algorithm, uh, first uh, RDML. Uh, and this is very popular because it is implemented in uh, the MGCB package, which is a popular R package for additive modeling. So I compared with this one. And uh, based on this, uh, so, and, uh, so we should compare the blue one and red one because these conditions are exactly the same. And based on this comparison, uh, the my algorithm is uh, much more faster than this uh, the MGCB uh, algorithm. And even for uh, one million sample, my algorithm took just one uh, five five hundred seconds to estimate uh, maybe seven or eight specially varying questions. So yeah, so based on this result, the compositionally wrapped approach will be uh, accurate, accurately estimate questions even from non-Gaussian data and also uh, computationally efficient. So I think it is uh, very useful in practice. Okay, so uh, in this first part, I have, uh, I have combined CWGP and additive modeling to automatically estimate distribution, data distribution and also to estimate a wide variety of effects uh, while uh, in improving the computational efficiency. So, so this is the modeling part. And uh, from now on, I will apply this approach to a spatial analysis of COVID-19 in the panel. Does it make a sound when I do that? Then, okay, so 
in this analysis, I basically, basically try to find some uh, determinants of uh, COVID-19 spread. So I mean number of infectious. So the explained variable is a uh, number of infectious per area by age group by prefecture by day. So because of the many categories, the number of sample, sample size uh, for 40,000. And in this study, I try to estimate uh, in impact from a uh, week, day, days of the week on age prefecture and age cross effect of age and prefecture. And from these variables, I assume a uh, group effect. So yeah, I estimate group effect, group effect from this variable. And from these three variables, I assume a uh, uh, I assume regression, specially varying questions or varying questions dependent on the covariate value. So they are uh, selected through uh, model selection. Okay. And this is the transformation function I assumed in this study. And uh, so this is the, num the number of infectious per area. And because it is a non negative variable, I first transform it to using a box cox uh, transformation for kind of rough, appro rough approximation to a Gaussian distribution. Then I standardize this variable uh, because it is needed for better convergence of this model. Then uh, I apply the third transformation t times here. Then finally, uh, I again standardized the transformed variable again, it, because it is needed to identify effect then the output is uh, transformed data. So, okay. And so, so this, is, this slide compares the uh, empirical uh, kind of accuracy uh, between with, without transformation model uh, and only trans box box transformation model and one third layer model on three third transformation model. And this y, what x axis means the transformed y, so data, the y is a uh, predicted value. So it is a fitting uh, plot for uh, about fitting, data fitting. So without transformation, uh, and, and if the, data, the, the dots are distributed in on a 45 degree line, the accuracy is better. But uh, based on this plot, the without transformation model is not accurate. And uh, even if we apply the box cox transformation, the accuracy is not uh, imp not improved. For example, the R square is a very small improvement. But uh, if I apply the third transformation, the accuracy is improved improved like this. And many many data are uh, along the forty five degree line, and so R square is also improved like this, and also BIC was improved. <laughs> but but uh, still the computation time is uh, quite close. Uh, so it is just one time realization. So maybe the computation time depends on the number of iteration until convergence. So uh, just one, just a reference. But, uh, the order is the same as the original linear, linear one. Uh, so they are, uh, even if I apply the transformation, the computation time is not increased. So this slide shows that our, by using our model, the accuracy can be improved without losing computation time, computational efficiency, I think. Okay. So from this slide, I will explain about the estimated effects. And here I will present the result with the one box cox and one third transformation. And I, this slide presents three estimated random effect, uh, group, group effect. Uh, so this is uh, estimated effect by week, and it's the estimated effect by uh, day, day of the week, and this is age. And based on the week, uh, in Japan, uh, the number of infections is smoothly increasing until the end of March, then uh, smoothly decreasing. And uh, it maybe it is very uh, for Japanese the result is very intuitively reasonable. So I think it is a good result. And this result shows 
the smaller、uh, number of infections in Monday and Sunday, and maybe it is because office, medical office closed in these days. And about age, the more number of infections just increase in between 20s and 50s, so working generation. So, based on results,、uh, commuting to office might increase. Uh, number of inf infections just because the 20 between 20s and 50s are like working generation. And to see this result more、uh, closely,、uh, the, this slide、uh, shows the estimation, estimated cross effect of prefecture and age. For example, this is Tokyo. And based on this result,、uh, in nearby, near major urban a r e a I mean, around Tokyo and Osaka, two major areas, the 20s t e n d to be infected.、And、Osaka is also like this.、Uh, but in other areas, the 40s or 50s t e n d to be infected. So maybe in the major urban area and other area, the, the primary the reason for being infected might be different. So, in Tokyo, maybe uh, uh, drinking or something by 20s might be a primary reason for in、uh, infectious spread. But in a non urban area, maybe the commuting might be one、uh, prim primary reason for the,、uh, infect infectious spread. So, I think it is an interesting result. And、uh, it, um, it is a residual spatial effect. And this, is, this slide shows the、uh, estimated effects, which could not be explained by covariates. And I assume spatially dependent effects and independent effects. And the, the, the left is an independent effect estimate. And based on this result, the Tokyo metropolitan area h a v e very high risk. So this means even if we consider,、uh, if we did, Deduct explained variables, still Tokyo is dangerous. So we need to、uh, do some more policy to reduce the number of infections in Tokyo. And the、uh, right one is the、uh, estimated effects independent between each prefecture. So based on this result, Tokyo is again hot spot, and Osaka and Kagawa is also hot spot. So this, so this is also, I think,、uh, intuitively reasonable.、Okay. Okay, so basically the analysis is like this. And maybe within one or two months, I will、uh, implement this approach in an R package, SP Moran. And so I, I try to uh, sim uh, sim simplify the implementation like this. So, yeah, if you have interest, please use this one. Okay, so in this study, I have combined CWGP and RDT model for、uh, non Gaussian data modeling and apply it to a COVID data analysis. And the major finding is、uh, like as shown here. So、uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So this is the time for question and answer. Murakami Sen, can you see the chat?、Uh, there are a couple of questions.、Uh, yes, 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 yes. Just check why it's c o t Oh,、uh, yeah, why?、Uh, so, can you see the chat screen、uh, in my slide? Okay, so I, I will. Uh, no, it's there. We, we can see only, only the shared slide now.、Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, I first、uh, have a question about、uh, why i is s c a l a r or not.、Uh, why, I, why i is a s c a l a r but、uh, why, why bold is a vector? So, and the second question is there.、Uh, so, maybe I need, I need to yeah, share. This is actually my question. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will、um, share my. Okay, okay, okay、yeah. I can see. It's fine. So, your screen, your question. So,、uh, my question is、uh, so, you, you use our SAL transform,、mm -hmm. but, and、uh, we need to take a Jacobian. But, uh, yeah, is yeah. there any.、Um, Issue of、uh, vanishing Jacobian.、Uh, If it is Jacobian zero, then、mm -hmm. or degenerate, then the, you cannot compute the.、Um, um, at, the, at, the at, yeah, at, at least I, yeah, at, at least I did not check that actually, but at least, at least I, I tested 20 layers 
But in that case, the Jacobian did not vanish. But maybe I, if I increase layers, maybe such kind of problem happens. But maybe because now the layer is kind of a straight line, and I mean, uh, simple structure, maybe at least the number of layers is not large. It will not happen as far mm. as I check. Mm. Um, so next one is also my question. <laughs> so, uh, perhaps uh, you already uh, will talked about the standardization after taking the cell transform. So perhaps uh, there is no binding mm -hmm. fabric issue, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, so there, no. this is already resolved. Uh, uh, okay, okay. So the, thanks, very interesting. Could you quantify uncertainty in derivation estimates? Uh, yes, I, I can. I can. I can quantify the uncertainty because uh, basically it's just an uh, extension of Gaussian uh, additive model. So very sim in very similar way I can quantify. And the last question: Could you explain a bit why the proposed method is so computationally efficient? Is there efficient method for computational cell? Uh, yeah, actually, the cell transformation approach is also uh, developed developed as a computationally efficient approach for Gaussian uh, kind of modeling. So originally, the CWGP uh, is computationally efficient. And, and because uh, for additive model, uh, there are many computationally efficient algorithms. So by, by combining both algorithms, I, I combined, I developed a fast computationally efficient algorithm. OK. So maybe there, we can also ask question by microphone. Is there any other questions? So I, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the uh, CWGP basically assumes that our observation is continuous variable. Uh, but uh, in yes. some cases, we want to handle the discrete variables like uh, binary or categorical data. Is there any such yeah. extension of the method? Uh, actually, in case of warped Gaussian process, there is a Bayesian a warped Gaussian process. And this model can handle this kind of this uh, discrete variable. Mm -hmm. But uh, in case of warped to com composition warped Gaussian process, maybe there is no such extension yet, I think. But yeah, it is, I think, very important uh, point in, in practice. So I want to uh, do something extension to that kind of, or that, that kind of distribution. Yeah, that's a kind of weak point of Gaussian process approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's very weak. I also need, always need to combat to a density for example, by, yeah. by dividing yeah. area of the yeah, it's a weak point. Okay, so someone has some question. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, that's uh, a question. Actually, it's a uh, comment inspired, uh, uh, inspired by Fumitsen says comment. Um, so I'm wondering that uh, um, if you can <laughs> replace the SAL transformation with um, a different type of transformation <laughs> to handle this discrete data, um, I mean, uh, recently the flow model has been very popular and um, maybe such transformation have to be somehow engineered to, to you know, satisfy the Gaussianity uh, in the end, so you can use the uh, GP method. But I think maybe if you use, say, um, some sort of neural network or something like that, uh, may oh. possible, it might be, I'm mm. not sure. So, uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I will consider, yeah. The actual extension to kind of neural network approach is, uh, I think, interesting. Thank you. Perhaps uh, Tanabe-sensei has some question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I'm just a question. This is the uh, two-stage method, I understand. Am I right? Uh, no, no, First, this is a uh, one-step. Uh, it, it, it simultaneously estimates okay. transformation function and additive model part. I see, I see. Hmm. So, so I understand the phi contains a lot of unknown parameters. Uh, yes, many parameters. Uh -huh. And you adjust it simultaneously uh, with the 
with the linear linear path, linear model. Yes, yes. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, I'm not sure, but uh, the uh, optimum function in R works pretty well, so it is eff estimated efficiently. So. I see. So yeah. how difficult is it to estimate this thing numerically? Uh, uh, currently, I this, optimize this, the... This is the com com convex pr problem or unimodal function to be minimized or not. Uh, yeah. I understand. Uh, I, 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 I suspect that uh, this, this uh, the to total function to be minimized mm -hmm. is just not a uh, very simple uh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. function. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. So uh, I basically I give up to find the global optimum. So maybe my, the estimate uh, I find is kind of local optimum one, but still in practice uh -huh. it, it, it estimate pretty uh, behaves pretty well. So I, I kind see. of accept. Uh. And how do you uh, how, how do you choose the number d layer of the this uh, uh, sound? Uh, at least in in my experiment, if the number of D is more than two or three, the results are very similar. So any value is okay. But we can choose by using kind of BIC minimization or other information criteria minimization. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. Maybe the virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you, Rakami san. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the second speaker. Sakata san, could you prepare okay. sharing the slide? Okay. Okay, great. So the, our second speaker is Ayaka Sakata, who is going to talk on active pooling design in group testing based on Bayesian posterior prediction. So Sakata-san, please start. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Good morning or good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to make a presentation in this workshop. I'm Ayaka Sakata from the Institute of Statistical Mathematics. Today, I'm going to talk about the group testing problem where a brief propagation algorithm is employed and an active pooling method is introduced. The contents of today's talk have already been published in the Journal of Physical Society of Japan, and the latter half is now on the archive. And uh, Ibasa in our institute will compile news and comments relating to this JPSJ paper and will soon appear in JPSJ. Okay. Let's consider a clinical test where we would like to identify infected patients in the population. Sorry. The simplest method is the parallel test in which all patients are tested individually. In this case, the number of tests is the same as that of patients. However, when the fraction of infected patients in the population is sufficiently small, it is known that group testing can reduce the number of tests to be smaller than the number of patients in the population. In the procedure of group testing, we collect specimens from patients and pull them based on a pooling method. These tests are performed on the pool and test results are obtained. 
we identify the state of patients from the test result. To do so, um, inference procedure is required. We need to infer the patient state from the observation whose dimension is smaller than the number of patients. So the problem is underdetermined and the solution is not uniquely identified. However, using the knowledge about sparsity, that means the number of infected patients in the population is small. The identification of infected, infected patients is sometimes achieved. This group testing program has a long history. It was first proposed by Dorfman in 1943 for blood test. His method is known as two-stage testing, where the patients are divided into sub-pools and the tests are performed on the pools. And the patients in the positive pools are tested again. In 1950s and the 60s, the generalization of two-stage testing was proposed. This method is known as binary splitting. The positive subpools are divided sequentially and tested again. The mathematical treatment of the group testing became extensive after 1973. The relationship between information science, in particular coding theory and group testing has been highlighted. This relationship motivates uh, researchers in information science and various studies are devoted to the information theoretic bound evaluation. And in 220, group, group testing is attracting significant attention due to COVID-19 pandemic. These, there are more than 4,500 4, preprints containing the keywords group test and COVID in med archive. In this talk, we consider an algorithm for identification of infected patients in noisy group testing where the test contains errors. In actual clinical tests, false results can appear with finite probability. We model this situation using a statistical model and identify the infected patients using Bayesian inference. And owing to its low computational cost and approximation accuracy, we execute the formalism by brief propagation. Here, we denote BP. The BP algorithm has already been proposed in previous studies, and we extend it to estimate the unknown parameters in the model. Further, we propose an active design method for pooling to reduce the number of tests required for the identification of infected patients. Our method is based on Bayesian posterior predictive distribution, and we modify the posterior to be realistic by sequentially taking the informative pool into account. This informativeness is measured by the predictive distribution. Now we summarize the mathematical form used in, used in this talk. We set the population size to N and the state of patients is denoted by a binary vector X where one corresponds to positive, namely infected and zero corresponds to negative and no infected. In general, the patient state and specimen states can differ because of the failure to correct the specimen. For example, the correction of specimens from nasal cavity fails to obtain a sufficient number of pathogens when the pathogen does not appear in the nasal cavity, even when the patients are infected. We do not consider this kind of failure and the state of the specimen and that of the patients are the same. 
the pooling of the specimen is specified by pooling matrix F, where F mu i equal one means the i's patient is in the mu's pool and zero means the patient is not in the pool. The true state of the pool is denoted by y zero, where it takes one, at least uh, one infected patient is included in the pool. Mathematically, y zero is given by the logical summation of the patients in the pool. We perform a test on the pool and the test contains errors and it is described by a function C and the obtained test result is denoted by Y. And the problem is formulated as the construction of estimator X from the observation Y. Here, we introduce several, several assumptions in the generated process of the test result. First, we characterize the test error by two parameters, uh, true positive probability and false positive probability. They are denoted by PTP and PFP. The input one gives input one with probability PTP and output zero with probability one minus PTP, which is a false negative. And input zero gives input one uh, output one with probability PTP, uh, sorry, PFP, which is a false positive. Second, the test errors are independent from each other. Under these assumptions, the generative model is given by these functions. Now, we introduce a statistical model for the inference of infected patient, uh, inference of patient states. In general, we do not know the true values of PTP and PFP, so we replace them with their estimates denoted by variables with hat. Further, we introduce prior distribution of patients using the prevalence law. This prevalence is also not known in advance. Hence, we use its estimates denoted by a hat variable. The inference using the posterior distribution can be graphically represented. This example shows a pool size of three and overlap two, where overlap is the number of pools to which each patient belongs. The patient states are represented by a variable node and the test result performed on the pool is represented by factor nodes. The marginal posterior is the basis for the decision and is a Bernoulli distribution represented by one parameter. Here we denote the parameter as theta of y. As the straightforward computation of the major posterior requires an exponential order of sums, so we resort to an approximation by belief propagation. In the VP algorithm, the infection probability is calculated under the tree approximation of the graph, and the derived estimates is denoted by hat variable with theta. This method is widely used in various research fields and is applied to group testing problems in the context of statistical physics and information theory and statistics. For details of the algorithm, see these papers in our paper. We now show the performance of BP algorithm-based group testing. The setting of the numerical simulation is as follows. The pooling matrix F is randomly generated and the constraint that the pool size and the overlap are fixed. Namely, the summation of F mu i in direction, in direction of i is mz for any mu, and its summation in the direction of mu is n, n o for any i. We generate 
100 samples of the pooling matrix through state of patients and the observation and discuss the average property with respect to these samples. Uh, in the inference, we obtain the infection probability of each patient. The purpose is to identify the patient state that is given by zero or one. So we therefore need to convert a continuous variable from zero to one to discrete variable zero or one. We use the map estimator which takes one when the infection probability is larger than 0 0.5 and zero when the infection probability is less than 0 0.5. And we quantify the performance using the true and false positive ways denoted by TP and FP. TP larger than PTP and FP smaller than PFP indicate that the error caused by the test is corrected by group testing. We focus on the PTP and PFP dependence of TP. In this figure, TP as a function of PTP is shown for different values of PFP. In this parameter region, a BP algorithm is larger TP than PTP. And this, uh, this diagonal line denotes uh, the relationship TP equal to PTP. And the dot over this line means the uh, group testing gives larger TP than the PTP. Namely, uh, the identification of infected patients with smaller, smaller false negative error is achieved using 500 times test when uh, PFP is smaller than 0 0.05 in this parameter region. The active pooling method shown later provides further improvement. Before we move to active pooling, I will discuss the estimation of the unknown parameter in the model. In this numerical simulation, the true values of prevalence, PTP, and PFP are known in advance. But uh, these parameters are not known in general. But these parameters can be estimated using the following two methods. The first one is the EM method. Wave propagation can approximately calculate the log likelihood, which is known as the beta free energy. Using this quantity, we obtain a recursive relationship regarding these parameters. The procedure consists of an E step and M step. In the E step, the BP fixed point at a certain value of the estimate is obtained. In the M step, the estimates are updated according to the recursive relationship derived by the beta free energy. Another approach is the hierarchical base approach, where the prevalence is regarded as a hyperparameter and updated in the BP algorithm at the same time as the patient's infection probability. These two approaches give the same value of prevalence in a sufficiently large population. And TP and FP for unknown parameters are the same as those for known parameters when the recursive uh, relationship has some fixed point. The details are shown in our paper. Now, we consider the active pooling design method using the BP algorithm. The group testing program shown in the former part is called non-adaptive group testing, where pools are determined in advance. Here we considered randomly constructed pools with fixed size, fixed sizes and fixed overlaps. Another approach is adaptive group testing, where Tools are designed according to the test result in the preceding study stages. The original study by Dohman can be regarded as adaptive group testing 
and binary splitting is also an adaptive approach. In these approaches, the negative pools are never tested again. This strategy is efficient for noiseless cases, but for noisy cases, this elimination of negative pool causes an increase in the false negative. These, approach ha these approaches have a limitation in the correction of the false negative errors. Here, we propose an adaptive method in the framework of Bayesian inference. Okay. Let's denote the posterior after new times test like this. Here, we summarize our notation. Y new with brackets denotes the set of test results from fast to new test. And F new with brackets denotes the set of proofs from fast to new test. F with tilde means mu slow vector of F and it specified a pool of new test. We define the predictive distribution for new observation Y, which is not known, and will be performed on an arbitrary pool P. And XP is the set of patients in pool P. Predictive distribution is a measure of how the current posterior can explain the unknown data, so which corresponds to uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, the unknown data corresponds to the test outcome. This function is the basis for uh, the adaptive pooling in our method. Okay, let's consider some possible predictive distributions. First, we consider the case in which the predictive distribution for y equals zero and y equals one differ from each other. In this example, the predictive distribution for y equals zero is close to zero, and that for y equals one is close to one. When the predictive distribution has this form, the test that will be performed on pool P is explainable. Namely, y equals one is consistent with the current posterior, and y equals zero is supposed to be the test error. Uh, meanwhile, when the predictive distribution for y equals zero and y equals one have similar values, the test that will be performed on pool P is not explainable in the sense that we cannot distinguish which result is uh, caused by error. This test result is expected to modify the posterior to explain this non-explainable pool. The difference between uh, this uh, difference between these two cases can be described by entropy. The former case have small entropy, and the latter case have large. Uh, sorry, the former case. Uh, sorry. The former case have small entropy and latter case have large entropy. And we call the entropy defined for the predictive distribution as predictive entropy. So the, our strategy for the adaptive testing is to set pools to maximize the predictive entropy. The form of predictive distribution is simple. Back to the predictive distribution, it can be expressed by a statistic Q, which is the function of the pool and the test outcomes. The meaning of Q is the probability given by the posterior at the new, step, new test that pool P does not contain any infected patients. So the predictive entropy is also a function of this statistics. So we can maximize the predictive entropy with respect to Q and the value of Q that gives the maximum entropy is derived as follows and we denote by Q star. In the derivation, we assume that PTP is larger than 0.5 and PFP is smaller than 0.5. And we choose the pool at the new plus one step 
that gives the closest value of Q to the Q star in the possible pooling space that is denoted by P. However, Q for an arbitrary pool is not known. The remaining task is therefore the computation of Q. We mentioned again that Q is the probability that pool P does not contain any infected patients. This expression of Q depends on the size of pool P. Here we summarize our notation. We denote the size of pool P using the notation of absolute value. And the indices of the patients in the pool P is denoted by P1, P2, and so on. And the estimated value of the infection probability of I patient and the test result of new step is denoted by theta of Y nu with brackets. When the group size is equal to one, Q is given by one minus theta P. That is one minus the infection probability. When the group size is larger than two, we need a correlation between patients. For the side two case, the covariance is required for the exact computation of Q. In the following, we consider the cases where the pool size is one or two for simplicity. However, the BP algorithm returns single body information that is denoted by theta hat. The simplest approximation of Q given by BP is the product of one minus infection probability in the pool. In principle, BP can calculate conditional expectations such as the expectation XI conditioned by XJ or XJ conditioned by XJ and XK. To obtain higher order correlation by brief propagation, we need additional computational cost. And the order of which increases as the group size increases. In this study, we use the simplest approximation given by BP, denoted by Q hat. In the numerical simulation shown later, uh, in the condition of numerical simulation shown later, uh, this Q hat gives a reasonable result in terms of TP. Uh, the efforts aiming at exact computation of Q negates the advantage of BP and uh, in the numerical simulation shown later, the conversion does not induce large improvement in identifying infected patients. So in this talk, we concentrate uh, the Q to the Q hat given by BP algorithm. Okay, now we check the performance of the adaptive method. We consider M group test and divide them into initial stage and adaptive stage. The number of tests in the initial stage and that in the adaptive stage are denoted by M initial and M adaptive and the summation of them is equal to M. In the initial stage, pools are uh, randomly generated under a fixed pool size and overlap. The possible pooling space considered here is restricted to P1 and P2. P1 is the set of pools with size 1 and P2 is the set of pools with size 2 and size 1. Of course, we can consider more uh, wide range of possible pooling space, but uh, we choose P1 and P2 for the simplicity in the computation. And the population size is fixed at N equal 100. And as, as is the same as the numerical simulation in the former part, TP and FP for the map estimators are observed. These values are uh, based over 100 samples of the test result and pooling matrix in the initial stage. These figures show TP and FP for the adaptive test. These solid, solid lines denote, denoted by random, uh, the result of the random test. 
Uh, in this simulation, uh, three, 300 tests are performed in the initial stages. Uh, in particular for TP, TP larger than PTP is achieved by uh, 340 times tests in uh, the adaptive test of P2. This uh, uh, the dashed line indicates the condition TP equal to PTP and the points over this line means the TP is larger than the PTP in the test uh, in case of the random test, uh, to achieve TP equal to PTP, we need more than 400 tests uh, to achieve the same performance as the adaptive test. We have observed that random test requires about 500 tests to achieve TP rather than PTP. Hence, the adaptive test can reduce the number of tests about by about 30%. And adaptive test is also robust to the test errors. These figures show PTP and PFP dependence of TP. So as increases the value of PTP, the test uh, likely output the false positive result. And as, uh, as decrease PTP, the test can, uh, test can return false negative result. Okay, so this uh, black line denotes the group test with randomly fixed Turing matrix. And the active method for both P1 and P2 Turing space with higher TP for uh, all of parameter region shown in these figures. So, okay. in summary, we studied uh, noisy group testing problem using a uh, brief propagation algorithm in the framework of Bayesian inference. And in particular, we introduced adaptive Turing method based on the predictive entropy and it reduced the number of tests required to achieve TP rather than PTP. And the codes used in this study is distributed on the web page. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Sakata-san. Um, so we take questions. Can you see the chat, Sakata-san? Yeah. Maybe the first two questions are mine, so I I ask question. So um, in the explanation of hierarchical approach to estimates are unknown parameters. Uh, okay. You said that the um, prevalence parameter can be estimated in a hierarchical Bayesian approach, but is it difficult to estimate the um, error probability, PTP and PFP also simultaneously? Uh, Is there I any didn't... Okay. Uh, uh, I did not try this estimates of PTP and PFP in the second approach. But uh, I think it is possible if we introduce some good uh, mm. prior to PTP mm. and PFP. So actually the computational cost is uh, less than, the computational cost of the high variable based approach is less than that required in EM method. So, mm -hmm. Uh, if possible, the, this, approach, this kind of approach is useful for practical usage. Okay, thank you. So, um, the next one is also mine. So, the, at the last part on the um, active pooling design, so you uh, showed only the uh, result of the size of pi is one or two. Yes. Uh, is it computationally difficult to apply the method for larger pi? 
uh, in principle, it, uh, we can compute the uh, probability Q for any pooling matrix, any pool. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this method, uh, we compute Q for all pool, all possible pools in P1 and P2. So as increase the possible pooling space, the computational cost to calculate Q increases. So I mean, that's already. Yeah, yes. So I quit P2. <laughs> but uh, if we can introduce some uh, efficient sample method in the pooling space, the computational, can, or computational cost can be reduced without the restriction on the pooling space, I think. Okay, so there's some sort of sampling and the greedy approach may reduce the computational cost. Yes. When you can't. Okay, I see. So there is another question. You yeah, this one, this one was from me. Um, so, yes, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, when you were talking about, for example, you say 400 tests in, 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 on the final slides, um, we know a kind of lower bound on how many tests are required. There's, a, there's an information theoretic bound. H how close is 400 to that bound? Uh, so I compare the, uh, this one to the information theoretic bound, but uh, as discussed in your paper, the uh, BP algorithm can achieve, cannot achieve the information theoretic bound even when the uh, even when the pooling pooling matrix is fixed. So uh, I'm not sure the active method can achieve the information theoretic theoretic bound. Uh, but okay, I thanks. Okay, and then I, I had a second question, which is this um, quantitative group testing problem. So instead of just learning there is a defective in the pool, suppose you learn the number of defectives in the pool, so you get more information. Um, would your estimators work better in that scenario or not? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think... Uh, Yeah. Uh, by introducing such kind of factor, I think the method will be improved. Uh, cause, uh, for example, we can introduce uh, uh, in in this talk we fix the prevalence at uh, prevalence of the prior in a fixed value. Uh, yeah, I have it here. But we can change this parameter uh, for for patients or for groups. But taking account such uh, kind of uh, realistic parameters, I think the method proposed here would be improved. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Nice talk. Thank you so much. May I ask a question? Yes, please. I have a yes. few questions. Thank you very much for very nice conceptually clear cut models. And I have a, I have a question about the case where the false positive sensitivity and specificity is lower than the, 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 than the one you mentioned in the simulation. Yeah. Uh, how, how the, for example, the page, page uh, 23, how these curves changes when these numbers is smaller than, than these numbers. For example, COVID case, a CPR test is only 70% accuracy or something. So, but, oh, yeah. but, what, how does it behave when these numbers is worse than the current this current simulation? So you you mean the num number is this one? Yes, in this case you have 
zero point nine true positive. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, and if this number is smaller, uh, let, yes. let, let me, something like uh, zero point seven in the yes. case of COVID yes. <laughs> case. Okay, so when the noise is uh, larger than zero point nine, such as zero point seven. Uh, yeah. We need more time to test more, more test to achieve the performance to be TP larger than PDP. Uh -huh. But uh, for for example, this case, okay, uh, right. this one is just for the point eight cases. Yes. Uh, so. The, our method is uh, powerful to when the PTP is uh, close to the point nine, but in this case we consider uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, this one, oh, this one, okay, oh, sorry, sorry, this right figure is uh, matches to your question, so yeah. this is for the case the point nine five. But uh, when this value decreases, this uh, region where this uh, PT, TP is rather than PTP shrinks. But uh, the, uh, when the uh, prevalence is sufficiently low, uh, mm -hmm. our method is uh, still better than the parallel test. When the PTP is approaching to the point 0.5 and the point 0.8 but uh -huh. I think the point 0.7 is uh, a little bit <laughs> uh, uh <-huh>. difficult <laughs> to achieve a uh, perfect identification uh -huh. in this problem setting. I see, I see, I see. In your slide 19. 19. <coughs> There is there is some num zero point five number in the formula. Ah oh, yes. How how this is chosen? How this number zero point five in the denominator? Uh, right. Is there any any any, any uh, decision uh, decision uh, variable parameter in this method? Uh, no, this 0 0.5 appears naturally as I the see. solution of the maximization of the entropy with respect to Q. So I, I think see. there are so many one. So there appear some one over two can appear in the maximization with respect to Q. And so this is naturally appear. Then it's not a uh, uh, parameter we can control. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Sakata-san. And uh, I want, I'd like to close today's seminar. Uh, we thank our two speakers and their, all the audience again. Maybe by the virtual applause. <laughs> and their uh, we are going to have the third seminar next week at the same time slot, so please join. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I close the seminar. Bye, see you next week. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.